we gotta start with a stupid jokes time, of course. Um, I want to talk about something before I talk about my talk. It's about um, a term that I hate, and we see a lot of like in ads and job job postings. And if you're speaking at a conference, you you will see this term that someone is a rock star. So I have a problem with this term, so I want to explain it a little bit. So this is a rock star. This is what a rock star looks like, and this is everything but a rock star. So in this case, this is us. We're giving talks and we're coding. So. When someone says he rocked the stage after his talk, it's more like he read his notes from made on a plane slides for 30 minutes pretending that he knows something. So it's the term rock star is not applicable unless you're the Rolex Stones in front of 1.5 million people. We are not rock stars. So why am I telling you this? Because I want to encourage everyone to give a talk at a conference. I've given this same talk in, in like 10 different conferences in, in front of thousands of people. But I think that everyone can do it and should do it. Try speaking at meetups, try speaking at conferences. It's nothing special because at the end of the day, we're just code monkeys trying to make weird libraries work together by writing shitty hacks. So that being said, Eosun uh, Kitsa, I tried to pronounce this. Sorry, this is terrible. I'm a rock star. Just kidding. I love front end, I love open source, uh, and I love making products. Maybe you've heard about some of my stuff. I have uh, custom React scripts, Mobix router, and couple of interesting products. This might be interesting if you're a front-end developer. I made a tool where you can, it's called, it's called CZ, cz.co, and you can preview a bunch of uh, devices at once, so you can test responsive design, and instead of testing it on one device, you can just look how does it look like in multiple devices at once. Uh, lately, for the last year, I'm focusing on giving React and JavaScript workshops for companies and conferences. So if your company or a conference is interested in one of these technologies, you can just drop me a line. And yeah, today we're going to talk about state management in a GraphQL era. I want to ask you, who is working with React? All right, who is working with GraphQL? And who is working with Redux? All right, interesting mix. So if you don't know what is GraphQL, it's the thing that's eventually going to replace REST, but you keep telling yourself that you're going to learn it one day if you don't know what it is. <laughs> but to tell you what really GraphQL is, is we need to see an example of a REST API. So this is a REST API. If I want to fetch uh, the activity from the current user, the friends from the current user, and a bunch of other things, I need to do multiple calls to the, to the backend. Or I need to make one meta call and call it on the backend, like grab me activity and friends and posts and likes, and then just fetch that one call. In, in GraphQL, how, how do you fetch all of this data? You just you combine everything that you need and you combine it into a query. So this is our GraphQL query, and we're saying give me the current user with all of his activity, all of his posts, his friends, all the activity from his friends, the like posts, and so on. So we can just ask the backend to give us a bunch of data, and then on the backend we have resolvers, and we decide how do we resolve all of this data. In my opinion, single page apps ruined everything. So we were aiming for a faster car, but somehow we, we ended up with that contraption. It's, it's not a faster car, it's a terrible car. So why, did we, why do I think that single page apps ruined everything? Because we put everything on the client and we complicated state management a lot. So when we talk about state management, uh, what, what are we talking about? We have forms, routing, inputs, tabs, filters, date pictures, menus, checkboxes, navigation. We have all of the small stuff, but the biggest problem with state management, in, no matter what framework you're using, if it's React, if it's Angular, if it's Vue, whatever, the biggest problem is data. So everything else can be easily solved with different libraries, different methodologies, and so on, but data is the biggest problem. So when I say data, what do I mean? And why is data the number one reason that state management is hard? We have data fetching, we have data caching, we have reading, and then the most complicated thing is uh, invalidating all the cache. So these are the four problems that we're dealing with and we're blaming it on state management. So just to throw you back a little bit, this is me writing my single page app in jQuery. It was spaghetti code. It was it was a one main.js file from 3,000 lines. There was no webpack, bubble, gulp, nothing like that. And I had a bunch of code, then I have a comment, like calendar starts here, and then you have a calendar plugin, and then you continue other code. So everything, it was, it, it was in one file. And I was looking for a solution. How can I simplify my state management? Because right now, I have everything into this one freaking file. And we were looking for a solution. That's where Angular 1 came along, and we decided to move on to, to Angular or Angular 2, or just Angular, whatever they call it now. I lost track of, of the versions. And I liked Angular because it's, 
it separated things for me, so I knew, okay, so this is how we can do state management, and it's way better than doing jQuery. And Angular one sounded fine in my head until I explained it to my roommate. So he said, all right, we've been talking about this Angular thing. Can we sit down and you explain it to me? I'm like, look, it's really simple. So you only have controllers and factories and services. You just put a service in your factory, in your controller, and everything goes in a template. You just inject it. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? So when I explained him the concept of all of these buzzwords that Angular 1 has, it became complicated in my head. Like, why do we have all of these things just to simplify state management? And then I was deciding, should, we use, uh, should I move on to Angular 2, learn TypeScript, or should I try something else? And that's when React came along, I want to develop how good it is, I'm running training on React, so yeah, it's the best to solve all of my problems. But when I started working with React, I was trying to be too smart. So when I first fetched my data, I have these three API calls, like the posts, and when I click on the post, I went to post number one, or I fetched the user info. But I hated the loading spinners that I was getting all the time, right? So you click something, there's a loading spinner. You go to the same page again, there's that loading spinner again. So I was like, how can I cache this so when I go to that page, the data doesn't refetch, but actually just read it from the cache. So I made my own caching mechanism, it's with just giant object, where the keys were the names of the API calls, and the values were the values of the API calls. And, and it was fine, I got rid of the loading spinners, but then the problem was, how do I validate this cache? How do I normalize data? How do I connect this piece of data with that piece of data? So it turned out I cannot do it with my own mechanism. I needed something else that can just grab a bunch of data, simplify, normalize it, and so on. And at that point, the most popular solution for doing this was Hitash. No. <laughs> What's Redux? So everyone was talking about Redux, blah, 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 like people are connecting React and Redux together, like it's one thing, you gotta learn it. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take a month off and just I'm gonna work on learning Redux. And in my opinion, if you ask me, I love Redux and I hate Redux at the same time. I love it because it's a genius concept, even if you're not working with React, with Whichever framework you're using, just go to egghead.io and look at the tutorial about how Redux is created from scratch because it's a pretty simple library. You can watch this video series where the creator of Redux just creates it from scratch, from an empty file. And it's really inter really powerful and interesting concept. But I hate it because it's redundant most of the time, it's complicated, and it's adding a lot of boilerplate. So it's not the perfect solution. If you don't trust me on this one, you can trust the, the author of the library. He's tweeting, no hard feelings, it's definitely overhyped, low level, and often used unnecessarily. And he wrote an article, you might not, so he created Redux, and he wrote an article, you might not need Redux. That's like a band releasing an album and telling you, don't listen to our album, maybe you won't like it. So I respect him because he can, he can be critical about his own library, because what it says here, people choose Redux before they need it. And that's really true. There was a post on Reddit, you can find it on, on the React, JS subreddit on Reddit, and there was a guy asking, uh, I just started with React, what should I do to use to, to do network requests? And of course, the most upvoted answer was this. He thought, you, okay, this is what's going me out the entire day, I think. <laughs> Alright, so the first answer was just use Redux Saga. Like, this is, if you're not familiar with React and the React term, this is such an overkill. Like, if, you, if your friend calls you that there's a spider in their house, and you're like, I'm gonna be right over with my bazooka. So it's that much of an overkill. Using Redux Saga, recommending it to a beginner, I hate that about our community. Like, it's like, everyone is recommending the most complex stuff to do the most simple things. So right now, there's a poor soul trying to connect two libraries, Redux Saga and Redux Form, just to make a login form. I can make a login form in, in five lines of jQuery, but if you Google Redux Form and Redux Saga, there's tons of questions on, on Stack Overflow. How do we connect these two? Just don't. Use React as it is, don't use this if you're using a simple login form. So, my roommate, usually I explain all of, his, all, all of the new technologies to my roommates. We were sitting in a restaurant, and he was like, look, I have this idea for a simple app. We have a lot of employees in my company, and someone is doing the coffee every day. And he was like, I want to create an app where we're going to press a button, it's going to randomize all the names, and just say that this person is going to make the coffee for the entire company this day. And he was like, we need index HTML file and jQuery and we'll be done in half an hour. I was like, no, 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 we need Redux. We're going to sit down in this restaurant, I'm going to teach you React, I'm going to teach you Redux. He's like, why? It's like the simplest app ever. I'm like, I want to introduce you to this concept of Redux and blah, blah, blah. When we entered the restaurant, it was day. When we went out, it was night. So until I taught him how to push something into array in, in Redux, it took us a couple of hours. So at that point, I was like, holy shit, this is too complicated. Like, State management shouldn't be like this. 
It's a lot of boilerplate to do something really simple. And I told him, I'm going to look into this other solution that I'm reading a lot about, Mobix, and I'm going to explain you Mobix tomorrow. And I went home, I opened the documentation for Mobix. It was so easy with observables and observers and everything. Like, it's way simpler concept than, than Redux. It's not the perfect solution, but it was way simpler. So I had time even to implement a face recognition API, grab, like, make a randomizer so he takes a picture of a bunch of people and then it randomizes their faces. So instead of spending my time on writing Redux boilerplate, I made something even better. And I was, I mean, I still use Mobex, but the problems with every state management library arise when you start messing with data. So I can use Mobex for face recognition and randomizing things. Yeah, it's really simple. But when you throw data into it, we got the same problems as, as Redux has. So we had this problem. It, it's not something new. We had jQuery versus Bootle, Angular versus Ember, GraphQL versus REST, Redux versus Mobex, React versus Vue, Apollo versus Relay, and so on and so forth. We have this complex since always. And the mistake that we're doing right here is we're asking what's better instead of what's suitable for my app, what is suitable for my team, what is suitable for our use case. So these are the questions that you should be asking when you're evaluating, should we use this or the other library for, for, for my thing? And people usually are asking this, what's better? I just started with React, what's better? It really depends on your situation and the context, because if you ask me, I think Trump is great. But on a golf course, as a president, he's terrible. Like, it, it's all about the context. If I tell you he's good or bad, I'm not telling you in which context I'm talking about this. So yeah, you know, people should evaluate things a bit more. In our community lately, if you're into React, you will see this statement. Higher order components suck. And then you have something on the other side. Render props are the best. And as community, we cannot find something in the middle, which is like, how about a healthy mix of both? So if you think you should use a higher order component, use that. If you think you should use a render prop, use that. But don't be one or the other. We have the same thing with Redux. Previously, it was like, we need Redux for everything. And nowadays, you can read articles. Redux is dead. So the library has like 40,000 stars and people are writing articles, Redux is dead. We're gonna replace it with a new context API. And the irony is, Redux is already using a context API and people are like, oh, React has a new context API, we're gonna replace Redux. And it's not as simple as that. So I think we should find something in the middle and just use Redux when it's applicable and don't use it when it's not. So I'm gonna show you some examples about how, if you're picking a stack that includes React, Redux, and so on, and GraphQL, how you can Oh, actually, no, this is not the example. That's the next example. So I'm going to give you an example of fetching data in multiple ways. So we have the fetch API, and we're saying fetch all my to-dos and do something with them. Then we're going to do the same thing with Redux. So in order to fetch a bunch of to-dos with Redux, we need to dispatch a fetch to-dos in it. Then after we fetch the to-dos from our API, we need to dispatch that it was success. Then we need to dispatch that if it failed, we're going to dispatch that it failed. So this is one slide. Then we have another slide. We need to intercept these actions and do something based on these actions. So if it was successful, we need to return new state. If it's um, when it's initiated, we're setting loading control. If it's successful, we're returning new state. If it fails, we're returning different state. It's like an entire slide to handle pushing something into array and set, setting a loading to true or false. With Mobix, it's a bit simpler. So we have only one slide. We have a class. We have a bunch of observable decorators. So we're saying that to-dos are observable, loading is observable, error is observable, and then we have an action, fetch the to-dos and do something here. Really simple. Can we make it even simpler? Yes, this is where GraphQL comes into play. Like this is too much code to fetch one piece of data. And how do we do it with GraphQL? In one slide, we can fit the GraphQL query and the React component that's gonna render the data. So I have this React component, which is just a class with a render method. And above it, I'm just going to decorate it with GraphQL. I'm just going to pass the data that I need here. And that's amazing, because now I have everything coupled in one file, and I, I, my component knows what it needs. So if someone, when someone is reading this component, he's going to be like, oh, this is pretty simple, because this component needs this data. We're going to fetch it from the server. Next time you're going to visit this page, it's not going to fetch it from the server, but it's going to read it from the cache. So you don't have to worry anymore about the cache, about do I need to invalidate the cache, and so on, because this is going to do the magic for you. And here we just read the data. If it's loading or not, we read the to-dos and we display the to-dos. 
The problem here with state management is if we were fixing the sink instead of fixing the well, and the sink was state management, like everyone is battling with, with state management, and the problem right here that needs to be solved is REST APIs. Like REST is the new SOAP. You know, back in the day when you were in college and they were telling you about SOAP and REST, and everyone was like, hey, REST, SOAP is that, well now think that REST is that, and it's, re and it's replaced by GraphQL. Because it automatically solves state management for you. So now if you look at this previous slide about state management, we have all of these things minus the most complicated thing. And now this is really easy to tackle. If you're using Angular, if you're using React, it doesn't matter. When you put your data and you put it in a library that's going to take care of your data, like a GraphQL library, now you're left with the simplest things. So you can put in a router, or you don't include any library at all. You build all of these things by yourself. You don't need global state management to solve all of these things. This is an example of a pull request. Um, when they moved away from Redux to, to GraphQL, to Apollo, they removed around 5,000 lines of code. So everything that was tied to data fetching and caching validating and so on, it was around 5,000 lines. So they removed 5,000 lines, they added around 1,000, which still they needed to add code for fetching data, but still it's a major win because now the, the entire app, the entire code base is way simpler. So if you ask me, do we even need a state management library when using GraphQL? My answer is always going to be this guy. Like, uh, I don't know. It really de depends on your context. So in order to help you, if you need to use or you don't need to use, I'm going to give you an example, sort of a few, uh, few sample stacks that you can use. And then you will see if you need uh, a library or not. So the first one is Vanilla. Uh, you can use Apollo, which is the most popular GraphQL client library right now. There are bindings for Angular, for React, for Vue, for everything. And you can use a router library if you want. You can write your own router if you want. And then in React, you can just use set state. So you don't need Redux or Mobux or anything else. The second one is I hate forms. So if you have really complicated forms where you have nesting and all these crazy things going on, you can include a form library like Formic or something else, but you don't need to include Redux or Mobux or something way more complicated just so you can handle forms. Third one is my users live in tunnels. So there's a use case where you would like to optimize your app for offline usage. And if you're using Apollo, you can just plug in this thing called Apollo Cache Persist, and it's automatically going to cache every query and put it into the local storage. So next time the user opens the app, it's just going to read it from the local storage until the network is on. And then when the network is on, it's just going to refresh the data. So this is a pretty simple, like you do npm install Apollo Cache Persist, you plug it in, and you're getting an offline app out of the box. So that's really awesome. The only problem here is with mutations, when you click on a like, or you want to do an action or send something to the server. So this is, they haven't solved this yet, and I'm, I think that they're going to solve it, make it work out of the box. So just imagine a situation where the user wants to click the like on a photo, but the network is not there. So that entire action of clicking the like is going to be saved into local storage. And then we're going to have a listener, when the network is back, just grab every action that is pending and just send them one by one to the network. But the thing is, right now, that's possible. There's a library called Redux Offline, if you use Redux. And you can schedule all of these actions and so on, but I really want it to work out of the box. Because as a developer, all I want to do is, here's a picture, the user clicks like on the picture, you handle everything. Like handle the optimistic response, if there's a network, send it to the network, if there's no network, put it in a local storage. I don't need to write all this code manually, because this is what it looks like. Now, GraphQL is pretty, but when you wrap everything into Redux Offline, and you add payload, and meta, and offline, and effects, and so on, and add this for every mutation that you have in your code, you're going to complicate everything to a, to a really complicated level. So I think they're going to solve this, but for now it's the only pain point. If you have offline apps, you want to do mutations, right now it's a bit tricky. Because you need to store them, you need to wrap them in Redux section, and it's a lot of manual work. Um, the next stack is I want to go home early. Uh, I like this tweet from the creator of Mobux. He said, because people are like, oh, Mobux, it's beautiful. I don't like it, I like Redux. And he said, Mobex doesn't try to, to prove any academic point, it just wants you to go home early. And it's really like that. When you start using Mobex and you're like, holy shit, this is so easy now. But if you're paid by the hour, you should stick with Redux because it's writing more code. And the next one is Next Level. Who has heard of Next.js here? All right. So Next.js is a server-side render framework for React. It reminds me a bit of WordPress and PHP because you literally open a file, open a folder called pages, and inside of the, these pages you have files like 
home.js, about.js, post.js, user.js, which are your pages. So you're still writing React, but everything's going to be server rendered and rendered to the client, and then the client is going to pick it up, and you can still do client-side things on the, on the client side. So it's really amazing because it combines these two worlds of server-side rendering and client-side apps. And what I like is to try to experiment with this next level 2.0, I call the stack. Use full page reloads when navigating between routes, and every route should be a mini app. And people usually react like, holy shit, I must write a single page app, right? I told you that I hate single page app. Have you been lately to Amazon, Airbnb, all of these popular websites? Is one of them a single page app? No, it's not. Why? Because they're smart. And we think we're smart because we're like, oh, my app is single page. When the user clicks, every but yeah, and your app is monolithic and it's huge because it's a single page app. What the big companies are doing is usually they have this, they have mini apps. So when you go to the, to the, to the home page, you'll be served one entire app. Then when you go to products, bam, full page refresh, you get served an entire different app. And then when you split everything by route and everything is, is a, its own app, then you're making state management even simpler. But what we want is we want a single page app. So I think that's what we're doing wrong. Can we use only Apollo for everything? For data fetching, for client side schema and so on? Yeah, when they released Apollo 2.0, they removed Redux. So Apollo was using Redux under the hood, now it's not. And it's faster, it's smaller, and it's more flexible. So this is what you had before. And this is what you have now. So the magic is here. When you're initializing a new Apollo client, you can add your custom cache. So you can write your own caching mechanism. If you don't like, if it's not fast enough, you can write your own cache mechanism, which is faster than that. And people have already done this. Like literally when they released Apollo Link, someone wrote Apollo Cache Hermes, which is a faster cache than the Apollo Cache. So they increased the flexibility, and one thing they added is Apollo Link State. So now you can have client-side state management with Apollo. So remember the, the query that we had for our to-do's component? Now we can also man manage like client-side things, like which tab is selected, what, what route are we on. And when this component needs to get anything from the server, or from the client, it can just describe it in one huge GraphQL query. So this component can say, okay, from the server I need this, but from the client I need the counter. Just imagine we have a stupid counter, one, two, three, four, five. And now everything is in one query. So we don't have to do, grab me the store, inject something from the store, blah, blah, blah. It, we just describe what we need here. And I think it's really powerful because every component is tightly coupled with the data it needs, no matter if it's from the server or from the client, it's all the data that it needs right here. Can we use only React for everything? We're going to do a little live demo about state management, like global state management in React. Um, can everyone read this? Or is it too small? Yeah? You can read it? You can or you can't? It's okay? Cool. So, let's see. So I have this component. I don't know how, how much time do we have left. To 4.15, right? OK, there's plenty of time. So I have this component, and it's just rendering one H1 tag with hello box. And what I want to do is I want to add global state management in my app, where I'm going to store all of my to-dos, authentication, if I have a user, if I don't have a user, and so on. So there's a new context API in React, which is really powerful. Previously in React, you weren't, like if you went to the context docs, you would see, don't use this, it's not stable, we don't advise you to use this in your own code. So now they're, they, they refactor this API a little bit, and they, they are advising uh, you to use context. So we're going to explain how does the new context work in React. So I'm going to create a context, and I'm going to call it theming context. So theme context equals React, create context, and I'm going to provide a default value. So the default value will be an empty object here. Now, my compute, um, now all my components can just consume from this context because what this does, create context, gives me two new components. So one is theme context dot provider, and one is consumer. What provider can do is it can set a new value. So let's say that my default context right here is background color black and color white. 
So this would be the object that other components are going to consume. And if I want, I can have a theme context dot provider, which is going to override these values, and it's just going to say I don't know yellow, and color pink. So that's what the provider component does. We can also have a consumer component, theme context of consumer, which will allow us to read these values. So let's say I'm going to create a header. So I'm going to say <coughs> header is a component. I'm going to make it a div. But instead of just, OK, I'm going to say hi, I'm a header. Here I'm going to add some style. I'm not going to add a background color. I will say the height is 200, the width is like this, and padding is 25. And now I'm going to use my header component above this H1 tab. And this is the header. But right now, this header doesn't have any styles, right? So I want to consume this theme. This is just imagine this is a really complex app. My header is not here. It's just nested somewhere. Let's nest it like this. Never write this code, please. And now this header wants to have access to, my, to, to the current theme. We can even move it to a separate file. Because right now you would think, oh, but it's already in the file. Why don't you just read it from there? So I'm just going to do header.js. And I'm going to export it here. Export default header. And we need to import React here. Raw React. Cool, so I have this header. It's in a completely different file. And now it needs to know about the current background color and the current color of our app. What, what is the theme of the app? So I can export this context so other files can read it. And inside of my header component, I can say import theme context from app. And now I can just wrap everything into a consumer. So I can say theme context of consumer. And what I need to do is this needs to be a function. So here I'm going to say theme. And this is where I'm going to have my background color, my color, and everything else. Okay. So now this can say my background color is theme.background color. And my color is theme.color. Header is undefined. We need to go in our app and just say import header from header. Just put it above this. And our header is black. If I change this to yellow, let's make it beautiful material design. There it is. Now our header can consume this context without being in the same file or what you would usually need to do in React if you need to pass a theme. Like let's say this is a theme. I'm going to call this a theme. And I don't have context. If I want to pass the theme to the header right here, and these are components, not this. I would have to do something like this. I would need to pass my theme to every component, like every component, until it gets to the header. So just imagine th these were components; they're not there. So I, we would need to pass them down. It's called prop drilling. And previously, there wasn't a simpler way for this comp this app component to communicate to this header component. So you either need to use Redux or Mobex or something like global state management put something in the global store, and then components read from the global store. And now with, with context, is changed. So now I can wrap my entire app here. Oh, I need to revert a little bit. All right. Now you'll be like, how does the header read the current theme? Because we don't have a provider anywhere, right? So this is the default value. So even if you don't have a provider, the, the, the header is going to read the default value. If I remove this, the color will be white again. So we would need to add a provider. So let's wrap our entire app in theme context.provider right here. And here we, I can pass it a value. So I can say background color is red and color is yellow. And now it's going to work again. So this theme context provider can provide context to all of the children components. Okay? No matter where, where they are, if they're in a different file, if they're nested in another component, if this header component had another child component, it can still call the consumer and just grab something from the consumer. Is this clear? So can we write a global solution, like a global store solution, that's going to store all of our data, and instead of including Redux or Mobix or something else, we're going to have like a component called global store. This component will only take care about storing all of our global state in our app. So if the user is authenticated, or what's the current theme, or what are the to-dos, and so on. So let me first do something else. I'm going to create themes here. So I'm going to say dark theme would be background color. 
uh, black and color white, and I'm going to create a light theme, which is going to be background color white and color black, right here. And I'm going to add a function called toggle theme, which is going to set the state. And it's going to say, give me the state, so the new, or let me add state first. So the state, we will keep theme name, and it's going to be talk. So at first, we're going to have uh, a state of this component, and the theme name is going to be dark. I'm going to remove the toggle theme. So now, instead of giving this value, I can just say theme, and theme is going to be equal this dot themes this dot state dot theme name, and the current theme name is dark. So this should be our current values for the for the current theme. So when I go here, I will get a black header. But what I want to do is I want to add a toggle function so our user from anywhere can click and change the theme to to the opposite theme. So I can create a function called toggle theme, and right here I'm going to do this dot set state and I'm going to grab the current state, and I'm going to say uh, theme name equals state dot theme name equals dark. If it's dark, make it light. If it's light, make it dark. And this is this is going to be the toggle theme function. And if I want, I can just add a button here, and I can say on click equals this dot toggle theme, and call it toggle theme. So it's going to work. When I click this, we're going to toggle the theme. Um, the thing is, what if we have another component called sidebar or footer or something like that, that that component wants to wants to call toggle theme, right? Because toggle theme right now is a function on our app component. So what if somewhere else I have this footer that that wants to change the theme? So let's create it. I'm just gonna be lazy and copy the header. I'm gonna make it footer right here. And this footer will do nothing special. It will just going to be, hi, I'm a footer. And we're going to put a button, toggle theme right here. So on click, it would need to call toggle theme. But how can it read toggle theme? It needs to read it from the context. Right now, our context is just providing us a theme. So it's not providing us any functions that we can work with. So what we can do in our app component, right here, where we're providing a value, Instead of a value, we can just provide, uh, instead of a theme, we can provide an entire object. So we, I can say theme plus theme, or we can remove this from year six, and I can say toggle theme equals this dot toggle theme. Or if I have multiple actions, I can just say actions. I can pass whatever I want here, and then every consumer can read from this object. So now I'm passing in actions and toggle theme. So right now in the footer, I will have the entire object here, like this will be entire object. But instead of reading it like this, I'm just going to deconstruct from it. And I'm going to say, uh, I don't need the theme, but I need the actions. And actions are toggle theme. Now I need to import the footer right here. So I'm going to copy this import footer from footer. And we're going to render it somewhere there. All right. Great, it's working. So let's see the problem here. I have my theme provider, I have the actions, I have a footer, uh, I have the consumer, I'm grabbing the actions, and on actions, I'm going to say actions the team. Uh, okay, that's debug. Okay, this is working sort of function, it's getting called, but maybe my state that theme name is dark, otherwise make it light. Oh yeah, now in my header, because we're providing an entire object, so now my header doesn't know about this. So we need to deconstruct here and grab the theme. Because previously I was reading the entire object here. And our object doesn't have background color. It has entire object dot theme dot background color. So instead of doing that, I can just deconstruct here, grab the theme. And now our header should work. So when I toggle it, the header will work. So now we have these two components. I'm not passing them anything explicitly, so I'm not passing toggle theme here. And I'm not passing theme here, but I'm just providing it to them through this value. We have time. So I'm going to write a global store right now. And you can use it as a replacement for Redux, Mobux, whatever, if it's really simple. So I'm going to create a folder right here, call it global store, global store. And I'm going to create an index.js file for the global store. It's going to be a React component. We're going to say global store. 
Uh, for right now, it's just going to render a div and it's going to grab the children. So whatever we put inside of it, it's going to render it. Uh, I need to import React from React and export the default global store. Uh, I'm going to delete the theme thingy so everything will go away. We are not going to have this context. We're still going to have header and footer, uh, but we're not going to have themes. And I'm not going to have a provider. We're not going to nest this like this. And make a mess for myself. Good job. Let me just close this here. Okay, we have header, h1, and footer. Now, what do we need to do? We need to import the global store from dot global store. And I can just wrap my entire app into my newly created global store. Everything should work the same. Component is not defined. So right here, I forgot to import component from React. So what will this global store do, just so it's not confusing for now? It's just rendering a div, and it's putting whatever it has as a children. Currently, the children is going to be another div. So it's just going to, uh, in context. OK, I forgot to clean up my context here. So clean up, clean up. Clean up right here, also in the footer. I should clean this up, and this, and this. And nothing is going to happen. OK, so now everything works because our global store is pretty stupid, right? So what do we need in our global store is I would like to store something in it. So I want to have some state, like to-dos, and maybe team name again, and maybe I want to keep uh, the user, so right now I don't have any user, so I can say user is null, team name is dark. And I want all of these other components to, to read from this state. So what we can do is we can kind of recreate our own version of, of Redux. So I'm going to go here and create something called reducer. And just export it, const reducer equals. This is going to grab state and an action. So it's going to have a switch, and based on the action type, it's going to say, uh, if case is add to do, you should return uh, to do's, the current to do's right here, plus add action dot to do. And it's going to have another case of, what should we have here? Add to do and, I don't know, toggle team. So it should return team name equals, if state team name equals dark, just give me a light, otherwise give me dark. So this is a completely separate file. We can write test for this. It's not tied to our component. It's looking like, like this is a real reducer from Redux. You can plug this into Redux. So now I'm exporting my, my reducer, but I should also export my initial state. So I'm going to say export const initial state. And from this component, I'm going to grab everything right here and put it into initial state right here. So this is describing this is describing the global state for my entire app. So here I can store everything, and here I can handle all the actions that, that are going to happen in my app. But somehow we need to provide all of this state, and we need to provide a way for our header and footer to read from the state and to call these actions, right? So what I'm going to do with this component is I'm going to import re reducer and initial state from reducer. And I'm going to say that state of this component equals initial state. And I'm going to create a method called dispatch. So what dispatch is going to do is going to say this dot set state, grab me the old state, but instead of deciding what, what I want to do here, just call the reducer that we've written in this other file and pass it the state and this action. So we need. All of our components need to know about two things, state and dispatch. So if they have access to state and dispatch, then they can use it to read the state or to dispatch to do something else. So first I'm going to go in my header component and do this, the same thing that I had previously. So I should, I should first create some context. So here I'm going to create context. And I'm going to say import React from React and export const uh, global store context equals react.createContext. At first, it's going to be an empty object. Now in my header component, I'm going to import this context from a global store context. 
And now I can consume the state from there. So I can put everything here, grab this, and this is gonna be my entire store right here, right? So now I can read from it, I can dispatch something to it, and so on. So instead of using it like this, I'm gonna grab um, state and dispatch. And this will be my global state, so I can read from it. And this will be my dispatcher. The header component doesn't need the dispatcher, it just needs to read about the theme. So here we're gonna say uh, background color equals if theme, oh sorry, state.theme equals dark, then use black, otherwise use white. And the same thing for the color, but the other way around. If it's dark, just use white, otherwise use black. So this, the header component only needs to read from the state. And our footer component, if you remember, it needs to do the same thing. So it needs to grab the context from the global store. It needs to wrap this div into global store context.consumer. And now it can also read from the entire global store here. But it will need the dispatcher. And right here it's going to say on click dispatch type toggle theme. That's it actually. Yeah. So what's going to happen here? The dispatch function is going to dispatch this object in our global, global store right here. Our dispatch function is going to grab this action, it's going to set the state, and it's going to go to our reducer. And our reducer is going to be like, okay, which action came here? Oh, it was the toggle theme action? So for the toggle theme action, this is what I need to do. So now from any place in our app, we can just dispatch this kind of actions. And in our reducer, we can decide what we're going to do with the state for that action. So the last thing that we need to do is, we don't have a provider here. So right now I have to do import global store context from dot context. And I need to change this with a provider. And as a value, I'm going to say state equals this dot state and dispatch equals this dot dispatch. And now every component in my hierarchy has access to my state right here, which is to do Steam name and user. And it also has access to this patch. So if I create a completely new component, call it sidebar or something, and I'm going to say sidebar equals something like this. And I'm going to decide that from this component, I want to add a new to do. So I can say button. Uh, on click equals um, new function dispatch and what do I need to do? Type add to do and we need to add a to do here like ID is one and title is hello world. Um, okay. And how, how will this work? We need to grab the we need to grab the context. So in every one of, of our components, when we need global state, we just grab the context. So we say import context from global store context. And we just wrap our component with this. So we say global store context.consumer, close it here, and then we have the entire store right here. So I can say entire store dot, dot dispatch or I can read values from the store. So just imagine, if you're using GraphQL for all of the data, and we have this simple file that's gonna take care of everything in our app, so if we have a user, if we don't have a user, what is the theme name, is like, I don't know, sidebar, collapsed, true or false. Uh, so this is gonna be the single source of truth for our entire app, and all of the, all of the other components are just gonna consume it through the context. So we kind of created our mini version of Redux right here with this. But if you did this previously, like before React 16, this would not be performant, it would not be good. Now with the new context API, you can really do this, you can use this code, and it's gonna be okay if you're handling small things. Like if you're handling all of this data and you do it in this component, don't do it. You're better off using Redux. But if you're using Apollo, if you just combine it with this, then you're gonna be fine. Um, 10 minutes left, so I'm going to go back to the slides. 
So using GraphQL in 90% of the cases, you're not going to need Redux models and so on. If you use it, you're like over engineering the app. Now I'm going to, like after the entire day of listening to people telling you about new technologies, well, blockchain and GraphQL and React and Redux, you probably feel overwhelmed, right? You're like, fuck, now I'm going to go home and everything is obsolete and my code sucks and I need to rewrite everything in Angular 7 because that one guy told me to, to do it. So that's why I have this portion on the talk, like who am I to tell you what to do? Or who is any speaker to tell you what to do? Like you should get a, a little bit of context about the speaker before you judge if you should listen to him or not. So here's the context about me. I work alone. I don't work for clients. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm experimenting with a new library every week. Like this is a concept that came out a week ago. And I'm gonna make a Christmas tree out of this slide. So would you believe a guy who does this in a talk? No. Um, you should always evaluate the context and your situation before you, follow, before you follow anyone's advice. If someone tells you use GraphQL, you should evaluate your situation. Can we move to GraphQL or not? A client project, project story. So we had a client, he wanted an MVP. We decided to go with GraphQL, but GraphQL can also get really complex. If you need to invalidate the cache, it's like, Jesus Christ, we need two files to invalidate the cache. So I decided, how about, after every mutation, someone clicks a like, just refetch all the data. And people are like, what? That's a lot of data. No, it's not. It's like 300 bytes, or half a kilobyte or something. So instead of over-engineering our entire app and following best practices about how you should invalidate your cache and so on, when the user added something, we just refetch all of the data for that page. So if that page had like five queries, it would fetch five queries. All in all, it would be one, two kilobytes for all the queries. But it saved us so much time because I didn't need to over-engineer my app with the Apollo cache and so on. So don't be scared of the network. Sometimes it's better to refetch things instead of your entire team spending weeks on over-engineering the perfect solution. And then your client is like, no, 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 we need to change everything. We want to move in another direction. So when you have a fast-changing project, just go for the minimum so minimal solution instead of over-engineering everything. Because I, I used to over-engineer also everything and then I decided I want to make my users happy and focus on that instead of making my code perfect and make everything like make myself happy. Because at the end of the day, what it matters is like you're gonna be like, oh, we spent the entire day, we learned RxJS or whatever, and our login form is now amazing because I spent eight hours of using RxJS to create a login form and your user is going to be, oh, I can log in. So after your entire work day, just evaluate what have we done for the user, not what have we done for us. Like you and your colleague, you can drink coffee, and you can go, man, we're awesome. We learned GraphQL today. But what are you delivering to the end user? That's the most important question. So raise your hand if this is you. Like insecurity is a huge problem in developers. I made something, it works, and I think it's awesome, but I'm not sure if it's right. Right? You're never sure if this is right or it's wrong, but no one knows what is right. Have you seen WebAssembly? People are putting freaking C++ on the web and no one is asking is that right or wrong. So just do whatever you're doing and just feel confident about the things that you do. So I think I'm gonna, no, we have time. Router examples. I have a friend who did something awesome with React Router. So he found a way to prefetch on the next routes. So the user, instead of seeing a blank page, is gonna see the next route. I don't know, so he did, he did something big. He was like, man, I did this. It works for us. It works for our use case but I'm not sure if it's right or wrong. I'm like, man, if it works, who, who are you waiting to tell you if it's right or wrong, right? If it works for you, yeah, just keep doing it, and, and it's fine until you hit some performance problem or, or something like that. You don't need to seek evaluation all the time. There's this other example. Do you know about this site, Normal List? The guy is running it on PHP without any framework and jQuery. So here we're like, no, we're using Redux. He's running it on PHP, jQuery, he has a couple of websites, all of them together, he has open revenue, make $50,000 per month. And he's not a good developer. You wouldn't want to write, you wouldn't want to work for him, his code must be a mess because it's just one giant PHP file. And when he started with web development, his brother was like, uh, this guy was like, I'm gonna do something awesome, I'm gonna deliver something to the users because I love, no one wants, I love traveling, so I'm gonna deliver something awesome. And I'm going to learn programming, I'm going to monkey patch my code until I deliver a product. His brother started at the same time, and his brother was like, I'm going to learn Meteor.js. And you know what happened after a couple of months? This guy had like 20k in the bank, and his brother knew Meteor. So his brother is now expert in everything in Meteor, but he never delivered something valuable to users. So evaluate also in that context. 
think this is the last example. Um, and I, I have, I'm having a coffee with this friend, and he's explaining me what he did with GraphQL. So he's like, man, you should see our stack, our GraphQL stack. We have a caching layer and a mechanism, so the, all the responses are a couple of milliseconds. It's like crazy fast. We optimize for weeks, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Are you like Facebook or something? Why did you do all of these crazy things to optimize your GraphQL? It's like, no, 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 we're just doing a website for a hospital. I'm like, there's no situation where the nurse is going to be a doctor. He's dying because our landing page is not fast enough. Like, why did you spend so much time on doing something not important to the end user, right? So, you shouldn't feel bad if you're not using the latest and greatest. In this case, you would hear about blockchain, about WebAssembly, about GraphQL, and you shouldn't feel bad. Who here has never used a service worker? Right? Like, it comes by default, I know what it does, but I never cared to learn about it and do something with it. I have a friend who was building a website for a conference, and she built the website, and the first thing she did, she added a service worker. Totally unneeded. Then she couldn't remove the service worker from people's machine, so she had to buy another domain just so they can serve a new website on a new domain and redirect to it. So it doesn't mean if you're using something hipster and, and bleeding edge, it's going to be good for your users. What do we have left? So, yeah, a summary of everything. Stop seeking external approval. Stop seeking answer always in other people's projects. Stop feeling insecure about your code because nobody actually really knows what they're doing. And delete your Twitter account. Like, that's a terrible place to be a, a programmer. If you like what you're doing and it works for you, for your team, for your company, you should just forget about this talk, everything I told you, just forget about it. And if you like what you've heard, you can, uh, I'm, I'm Kitsa Everywhere on every social network. My website is Kitsa.io, except on Twitter. Some asshole like tweeted once and took my account, so I'm the Kitsa on Twitter. And you can find more about my training there. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but move to Messi. And thank you for listening. Thanks. If you have questions, I'll be around, so I don't think we should take time for questions now.